Hey guys, we are back with Why the Pros Play, and this time we're going to be looking at Lauber's Diablo. Now, the thing about this is, Lauber plays Diablo a little bit different, um, and we, we've we been seeing a lot of like the auto attack build, um, but again, something like a Murden, you generally don't want to go auto attack build because you can cut your auto attack speed in half. Um, so you usually don't want to go that build. We've seen the W build used a lot by the Koreans because it's a very consistent build. You can get uh, a lot of slows, damage reduction, and you get to heal yourself without needing to be too close to the enemies. But Lauber is pretty confident. Um, his Diablo was kind of the bane of Europe. When um, Granite Gaming was winning all the major tournaments in Europe, and when he was on Granite Gaming, um, he was playing Diablo and absolutely dominating with Diablo to the point that people were just banning Diablo against Granite Gaming even when he was considered a little bit weaker than he currently is. Um, and so he's received buffs since then and Lauber is back playing Diablo. So Lauber's uh, Diablo is just a tad different. He goes kind of an older build. He goes into the Q build and takes Malevolence for that extra burst damage. And we're going to see why that ends up being such a big deal. Um, but let me explain a little bit about Malevolence and what it does. Malevolence is a talent that says basic abilities cause Diablo's next basic attack to do an additional 108 spell damage. This increases with level. You saw that it was 104 and then it bumped up to 108 as he gained a level 2. Um... It's about the same damage that your basic attack does. So effectively, it makes it to where when you use an ability, your next basic attack hits twice. Um, and it stores two charges. So generally what happens is he slams someone against a wall, and then he flips and gets two basic attacks. Um, or he might W, and then slam against the wall, get a basic attack, a flip, and then two basic attacks. Allowing it to where he gets six basic attacks and the slam damage on a single hero. And this ends up getting to be a crazy amount of damage. I mean, six basic attacks is 600 damage. So if we were to find, let's say, where the Junkrat is. Let me go find the um, the Junkrat really quick. There's the Junkrat. If we were to look at Junkrat's health, he has 1,400 health right now, about 1,500. So Diablo can do more than a third, uh, almost 40% of Junkrat's health with just basic attacks this end. And that's what makes this build so scary, is that the tank can almost do, I mean, with the stun included, half of an assassin's health in a very short amount of time. And the enemy's going to be stunned for that, so the enemies, or so his, his teammates can follow up on it. Particularly a Stukov could follow up with like a 70% spell in silence. There are uh, a lot of potentials that can happen when you have a Diablo that's this good. He likes to wait a second after his stuns before doing a flip to see if his team is following up, number one, but two, to, to wait to see where the enemy is going so that he can adjust and make sure that the flip gets the most value. In the early portions of the game for Diablo, particularly on this map, you're going to be just double soaking with your team. Now, Diablo does not have the ability to double soak alone, which is why I said double soak with your team. Otherwise, you kind of just sit here and wave and there's not too much you can do. You need to be careful with Diablo. You don't want to go in on targets you can't kill. You see, there's a lot of times where someone like a Murden might step in front of a wall to see if he might be able to bait a Diablo in. Now, these competitive players, they, they know the enemies most likely won't fall for it, but there are certainly times where you still are going to try for it. Someone like Red Robot um, is used to in Storm League, where he can step in front of a wall, Diablo charges in, and then he can counter engage against the Diablo and get a kill. So as it stands, um, they're just doing what they can to try to take out Lauber. Now in this build, it's a lot easier to take him out than in the other builds, um, but he's a lot more effective in short bursts. So he ends up taking a fountain, and you can see that fountain's going to heal him for his entire health bar. And that's because he took Devil's Dew at level 1. Devil's Dew's really good on this map, and I've always said that Diablo's level 1s are all situational, and most of them are map-based. Uh, Devil's Dew uh, is great on maps where you're going to be fighting in the middle of a wave, or fighting near uh, globes or fountains. Beast on Fear is really good into, uh, and in this case, they're using a portal to see if they can't catch Madara out of position. They get a, a charge, but not quite a stun, um, nor a flip off of that. Then, if you're not fighting in waves, you'll usually take Feast on Fear. You're going to take Soul Shield, depending on the opposing team. And so he ends up taking Devil's Dew because they're going to be constantly fighting in waves. 
ends up catching the Rhaegar out of position, flips him, but he doesn't end up wanting to take too much damage here from the bomb, so they don't end up going for this fight, they just back off. The Great Silence comes out from X-Ray that's just making sure that uh, the Nazebo didn't step too far forward, and Lauber's still in a pretty good spot. So, in low ranks, if you can get good at this playstyle of Diablo, um, right now he's playing against professional players. They're not going to make as many mistakes. But in low ranks, I actually used Diablo in um, two of my, my Bronze and Masters challenges. One was just my first one that I could play any role I wanted. And the second one was my tank only Bronze to Master challenge in which I used Diablo a good amount of the time. Enemies make a lot of mistakes, especially when you're ranking up. But even into the, the Platinum Diamond range, there is a considerable amount of tank er, uh, tanks that make mistakes and... And just mistakes that tanks can abuse. So it's it's really good. So four minutes in, he ends up getting his souls. And he ends up picking up Malevolence. And now this is going to be the point where he can be very, very scary. If he lands those stuns, an auto attack, another auto attack. You see that extra damage. And he's able to take out that target. So a great silence comes out um, by X-Ray to follow that up. But in order for X-Ray to land that silence, that slow, uh, it required a tank to get that engage. And so that's something that Lauber really can get. Another thing, too, is you're going to see Lauber uses Fire Stomp a lot while sieging just to get that extra malevolence damage on his next basic attack, as well as to kind of top himself off a little bit. Once again, you see that he goes in for the same combo. He ends up body blocking, and he goes for a lot of targets most tanks wouldn't go for, purely because he's played a lot of Diablo and he knows what he can get away with. And this is something that makes Lauber's Diablo a little bit different. But it's still, this is the level of play you want to see from pro players. You want to be able to abuse mistakes that people don't even think are mistakes. The Nazebo probably didn't think that hiding behind two turrets in a fort against only three targets was a mistake. Um, but it was, and Lauber abused it. So that's something that's, uh, that's really scary. Now they're already a, a full level ahead because of the three kills that he's led to. And that uh, Stukov's followed up on. He takes Apocalypse and... That's where you're generally going to start seeing any Q build Diablo is going to want to go Apocalypse. Apocalypse is going to allow for those uh, those quick combos where you can APOC combo someone to lead to a bigger stun. And it also allows you to engage on someone that's in the middle of nowhere rather than engaging someone that's uh, near a wall. They end up starting to go for a boss since they do have a level 10 lead. Uh, but they do need to be pretty cautious because level 10 is a decent lead to have but it's not a perfect lead. Now, the D.Va and the Nazebo still haven't approached, and so this is ending up to be a, uh, a relatively free boss. We can see that there is a trap there, so he's trying to position himself to where the trap won't hit him when the boss gets taken out. But uh, overall, he ends up just getting hit by the trap right before the boss gets taken out, so he's fine. Uh, now, they're actually going to look for another kill. I mean, they still have those level 10s, and he's heading down there. I, I think that he needs to mount up. I'm wondering if he doesn't know that he's sometimes... Uh, I'll watch his stream sometimes, and he, he has his, his camera pretty far forward, and uh, sometimes that'll happen where he gets dismounted. Now, if they can burn the bomb right here for D.Va, that'd be really big for them, because then they won't have it to defend against the boss, nor uh, for a siege. And so that's a great pick for them. And you can see, even with the power of Medivh, he's actually not using Medivh that much. He's mainly just going in on the targets that he wants to go in on. Um, and he doesn't even really need Medivh. So he does an APOC combo onto the D.Va. They get D.Va very low, and it allows uh, Dayquaza to finish off that, that D.Va. And now he just kind of steps forward and doesn't really need to worry too much about anything else. Um, and again, so far, every single kill this game has been set up by him. So let me talk a little bit about what you should be looking for in the early, the mid, and the late game portions for Diablo. Early game, you should be looking for people that are out of position. Um, you should be holding lanes if needed, but you don't have double soaking capabilities. So you kind of want to defend your double soakers and you want to look for people that might be pushing a little bit too far forward. Those are the easiest uh, ganks for Diablo. Someone that's pushed too far forward because let's say, for example, you're Diablo and you're at mid lane right now. And the enemy has something like a Kerrigan or a Sonya or something that's pushed a little too far forward. Usually your soul laners have enough power to take out the enemy target if given enough time. And so if someone's pushed a little too far forward, you can just walk right up like this. And the enemy either he needs to go up this way, which means that you can stun them against this wall, or you can stun them against this wall. Or they need to just go this way, which you can stun them against this wall. If they're in the bottom lane and they're pushed a little too far forward, 
they're a little too far to get stunned into a wall, but you can certainly just push them closer to your team by coming down this way and push them this way. And then when they start getting around you, you can just flip them back into your team one more time. So he's really good at getting people that are pushed a little too far forward. When you start reaching the mid game and you get your ultimate, you're going to want to be looking for areas that you can stun them into walls or areas that your team can follow up on. If you can, if your team can follow up your, your engage um, and they're against a wall, feel free to just slam them right into the wall and set up your team. If there's no walls nearby, you can use Apocalypse to set up a pretty good engage by charging in, or sorry, APOCing, charging in, flipping them onto the APOC, and then that uses up all of your abilities. So that's really your best engage for that moment. Um, but you can get those extra couple auto attacks because you're going to get your charge, your flip, so you'll get two extra of the Malevolence procs, which means, again, it's like you're getting four auto attacks off of a single Apocalypse, which is really, really powerful. Um, and so that's really going to be your mid game. When you start reaching late game, there are a lot of tricks you can do um, when you start taking something like domination, because then you can charge in, you can flip a target, charge it back to your team. You can APOC a target and then reposition and slam them against a wall while they're stunned with APOC. Um, there are a ton of opportunities at that point when you take domination. Um, so the mid game is pretty much just getting APOC combos, potentially getting stacks on Devastating Charge, but this isn't really the, the biggest thing to get stacks on anymore because the upgrade is just a little bit of an armor reduction. Just taking this talent and getting that 50% more collision damage is pretty big because um, it currently does 208 damage. Getting that extra 50% is an extra 100 damage. And that extra 100 damage is pretty big because it's, um, again, it's like getting almost another auto attack in there whenever you hit someone and if you combo that right with domination you can slam someone against a wall like this then you can flip them over here and slam them against this wall you can get the crit damage twice um and if you did have your quest completed then the second one they'll take 15 percent more damage on so there are a lot of really really cool things you can do post 16 and you just need to make sure that you plan it out one other thing that you can do that laver sometimes does but i don't remember if he does it in this game um, if you see enemies that are hiding like back here and your team's over here, you can actually charge this minion, which will get you to right here. You can flip a target and then you can push them back there. So it, it kind of gives you a lot more setup range rather than just trying to get in range to charge them. Because if you're just getting in range to charge them, they might just stay pretty far back and you won't ever have the chance to charge them. But you can charge minions to get yourself closer so that you can then flip those targets. So keep that in mind. So again, he doesn't go in on targets that like his team's nowhere near. He calls out this target, but he doesn't really go for it yet. He waits for his team to show up, and after his team shows up, then he goes, okay, we can go for this. He charges the target, but that was a really great um, knockback on the, on the side of D.Va because it was able to knock Diablo back far enough to where he can't get the, uh, the flip. This is a time where he does use some portals a little bit, but it doesn't end up leading to too much. It ends up getting the kill on the D.Va, something that the, the Mediv was able to allow him to do that he wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. The other reason why having a Mediv with a, a Diablo is a really good idea is because of Leyline and Apocalypse. Leyline locks people down for three seconds, so as long as you wait for the timer to go a little bit past half, um, or even just reach the halfway point, you can pop APOC and then everyone gets stunned when they get out of the, uh, the ley line. So this is the other reason that I think is, is so good for running Diablo um, in the competitive environment. Junkrat's being used a ton in the competitive environment and uh, APOC almost completely turns off Riptire because he pops Riptire and you pop APOC and now he's going to get stunned out of the Riptire. So he only has 1.75 seconds to pop the Riptire, which means most likely it's not going to be the place that he wants it to be in. So not only can Lauber lead to kills with APOC, he can lead to kills without APOC and he can use APOC to counter an enemy ult. So Junkrat almost has no ult and without an ult, all Junkrat is, is kind of picks by, by knocking people into his team or poke damage, which Stukov could outheal the poke damage almost all game long, and Medivh can answer the pick. So with their current draft, Junkrat actually does nothing this game as long as everyone holds their abilities for the right moment. Uh, the rest of the team can just get dropped by Diablo, and 
this leads to a really powerful draft and it also leads to diablo um kind of having free reign against their team so he ends up taking devastating charge again this is much more of an all-in make sure that you have the right opportunity comp than something like the auto attack build where if you make a mistake you auto attack a few times to get lower cooldowns you can out heal it and you can just jump away but um as it stands this particular team comp is just going to be a uh or this particular build is it's definitely more all in so he's actually going to get knocked in here a little bit more gets a great shield he's going to be able to get up to the portal and get out on time um keeping his team with no deaths now that's something that again in this build is a major risk if you're not going to be running with something like a medivh or uh, a healer that can give you a bit of an escape like maybe an anduin um you need to be cautious about running like an all-in build like this because if you charge in sure 50 armor is awesome um it's gonna make you really scary for a short period of time sure malevolence is gonna make you have a higher chance of killing a target devastating charge is gonna have a higher chance of of leading to a kill but you're a lot squishier so this is the the time where you will want to adapt a little bit is there are other builds that are being used in a competitive environment both w build and auto attack build are still being used breath is still used at times apoc is used at times i think apoc's gotten a lot better since they removed medallion so i think in a competitive environment we're going to be seeing a lot more apocs and we'll see lightning breaths but uh there are still a lot of reasons to take uh lightning breath it gives yourself an unstoppable it's better against uh burst teams so he actually ends up tanking a few shots here and just ends up getting healed back between his uh his fire stomp as well as the the uh um but overall they're they're not really doing too much here they're waiting for 16s and they're looking for opportunities that enemies are caught out of position and that's really all that you want to do so approaching the late game um you're going to be abusing your domination you're going to be abusing your hellgate and uh and in this case, I mean, I wonder if there is a world that he goes dying breath just because he can lower the cooldown, hitting something like a Nazebo and a Pyre at the same time with his ult. But, um, because, I mean, the way that, I, I think he still goes Hellgate just because you get a guaranteed kill, but, um, dying breath's interesting because you, you lower your APOC cooldown by 25 seconds for each target that you hit, and if this goes out at the same time as Tyre, then he ults and it counters Ravenous Spirit and Tyre. And then he can also still combo something like a D.Va. And that would hit three people with, with uh, your ults. Putting it on a 25 second clip. Um, he ends up just using an APOC there. I, I didn't see if there was a... It didn't look like there was a Tyre or anything. I think maybe he just thought he was in a closer range. Keep in mind that Lauber is currently on higher ping. Um, he is a European player playing on about 150 ping. So that is something that uh, he has to deal with, and that might have been the reason why that, that APOC didn't end up stunning any of the targets that he wanted to go on. It stunned the, the Nazebo, but I don't think it was supposed to stun the Nazebo. So now that he's level 16, you can see that domination. So just one more time, so anyone that's unfamiliar with what domination does, casting your overpower resets the cooldown of your shadow charge. So your overpower is your flip, and it just says casting it. It doesn't need to go to the full stun. It doesn't even need to stun the target. And it doesn't need to be used on a on a heroic target. It doesn't need to be used on a hero. It can simply be used on a minion. So one of the other strats that we've seen um, Diablos do, uh, Lauber in particular, is he'll charge this minion and then he'll flip it and then he'll charge someone again. Um, and it allows him to have almost an Anubarok engage uh, without needing to be a Anubarok. You can have the survivability of Diablo, but an engage like an Anubarok, which is kind of neat. So now they're able to take another boss for free because they had that, that level lead. And again, every single kill that they've gotten so far has been set up by Diablo. Um, this is a great engage. Now this is, again, this one's kind of a more of a Medivh setup than a Diablo setup. Um, so I would say arguably five of the kills have been Diablo. Two of them have been Medivh still even with a 5-0 lead they would still have uh level 16 talent tiers ahead of time they would still be able to get those two bosses that they got um and uh, again these are just some incredible plays and it's great because in the competitive environment medivh gets banned a lot but diablo really doesn't anymore 
So if you can learn to play Diablo like Lauber, you can really set your team up if you're in the competitive environment. And, and again, in Storm League, it works as well. I've used Diablo in, in every rank. Um, now, I generally will go auto attack or W build, um, just because this build's a little bit too all in. If you don't, even if you kill the target you want, killing one target's not as valuable in Storm League as it is in, um, in competitive. You, you kill one target, your team can usually get whatever objective you want. But in Storm League, if you kill one target, like, sometimes the enemies can still win the objective. So I generally like Breath, where I can do, like, 80% of everyone on the enemy team's health if they're in a bad position. Or I like Auto Attack, where I could stay alive and just zone, like, three or four people out of a fight. Um, but uh, this build is pretty strong in the competitive environment. Or if you're just playing with uh, a couple team members that know how to follow up. So you can see again, he doesn't get too many stacks this game, and this isn't really a talent that he takes just for the quest. He takes it for that flat 50% damage on the shadow charge, because the way that his build is set up is that if he does catch someone in these hallways like this, if he catches like, let's say, we, we saw it earlier, um, I think it was against the, the Junkrat or, or Rhaegar, um, actually it was Ice, the, the they did an ice block, so it was the Nazebo. We, we saw it earlier with the Nazebo. He portaled in, slammed a Nazebo, flipped, slammed a Nazebo. And that's something that we expect a lot on a map like this. And this is one of the best maps for Diablo because of these hallways. Um, almost anywhere in these hallways, if you charge and slam someone into a wall, you can flip them and slam them into another wall. And if you combo that with a, a, an attack from Malevolence, um, on the first slam, an attack with Malevolence, a flip, and then a slam again, and two attacks with Malevolence, plus the extra 50% damage, uh, you'll end up with enough damage to kill just about any target that's not a tank uh, or a bruiser in here. So any backline target that you can catch in these hallways, you can kill by yourself as Diablo in this build. So it's another reason why he really likes this build, is just because in the competitive environment, if you can blow up something like a Nazebo or a, or a Junkrat, and you don't even need to worry about anything. So, again, he likes to say mounted for the, the majority of these uh, setups. Just because if you can get to a good angle to where you can set up a stun, you've pretty much already won the team fight. You can see he's just sitting in a position where he can get a decent APOC off on, on a target. And he ends up getting a little bit lucky here because as he's going to find a target to APOC combo, the Junkrat ends up popping his ult. So he's able to APOC. Forcing the Junkrat to pop his ult early on the wrong targets doesn't end up hitting the targets that he wants. And the best part about him not hitting the targets that he wants is if this were to get to level 20 then Junkrat's probably not going to be able to get that cooldown reduction that he wants from his ult when he gets level 20. So this is a really good setup. Forces the enemies in, into uh, kind of a, a more difficult position, allowing the Webweaver to get some value. And it looks like they're going to close out this game right here, or at least they're going to try, but they don't end up closing out this game. They have a bit of a rough fight um, purely because just how this, this kind of plays out. The enemies get a, a couple good ults, his team gets a little bit out of position, and uh, and they're not able to really follow up too much. And he doesn't end up getting the stuns that he needs, and they want those more bursty fights when you're running this build of Diablo. They want to be able to stun, get the kill that they want, and then just back out of the fight, and then reposition and be ready to go in again. But in this case, they're not able to get those because the teams are so spread out that they can't really get that pick that they need. So he knows he's going to die here. He just wants to try to stall out the enemies as long as possible. He loses his souls. Now, in this build, this is another one of those builds where auto attack build is punished pretty heavily by losing your souls, but Q build, not so much. Um, it's only really the difference between 25 armor and 50 armor, as well as only the difference between about 30% of your health. So you're not really as punished as like auto attack build where you lose something like 70% of your, your self healing. And the other thing that's great about this is um, with sacrificial souls, you can actually gain a lot of your souls back. Stunning a hero with shadow charge gives you 10 souls every time that you do it. And the later these fights go, he's going to be getting a lot of those stuns. And, and worst case, he can just throw a couple quick stuns onto someone like a Murden, even if his team's not nearby, just to get a couple extra souls. So this is another build that's pretty good and competitive because you're not limited um, by that. Now, he could have APOC there, but he actually got a stunned by a Red Robot. It was a really solid stun. 
He actually moves to a different position there to stun him against the wall, but he doesn't have his stun available, so instead he just tries to use his Apocalypse to get that stun. Doesn't end up getting it, but it forces the Muradin to jump into a position that gets him killed anyways. And now they can just walk up to the enemy core since they've already dropped it down to 61%. They've taken out the enemy tank. Um, all they really need is one pick to close out this game, and they've got a Diablo. So they're just going to go right in onto the, di the D.Va. He charges her against the wall, forces the out the... Uh, the in uh what's it called ancestral healing um now it will be off cooldown now but uh, at least that's the mech out of the way so a couple of them portal in he decides not to right he, he's focused more on just leading to a kill Ooh, that's actually interesting so generally when you go hellgate you have a guaranteed hellgate stun and the way you do the guaranteed hellgate stun is you hellgate on a target and then you flip them and between the time of the animation to flip them and the stun, only a 0.25 second stun, um, it leads to a stun almost every time if you do a Hellgate into a flip. So that's usually what you do in a situation like this, but he actually just used the Hellgate for mobility there, and then he just pulled the D.Va, flipped the D.Va, and then pushed the D.Va into his team leading to an easier kill than just getting the stun. And that's probably better because if the cleanse is available, D.Va might actually have lived there if all he did was relied on the Hellgate. But it opens up those possibilities where you have all those different options. You can either just lead to the stun first and then slam against the wall, doing a lot more damage and a lot longer stun, or you can push them closer to your team, which if you watch like my Tychus video, that's a lot more valuable for like low range heroes. There's a lot of different options that you can do. And this is where post level 16 on Diablo, you need to get really creative because the basic engage is what the enemies are expecting. Doing things that are outside of the basic engage is the way that you take good players and you absolutely dominate against good players. Against bad players, you can do the basic engage all day long because they just don't adapt. Um, but when you start going into the the diamond, the the masters and the grandmasters players, you need to get creative, and that's one of the reasons why these pro players abuse things like Hellgate and abuse things like Domination is because they can and they can get away with it. So what we end up having is him getting a quick pick from that, and now his abilities are too long of a cooldown to go interrupt the Nazebo, so he ends up just going onto the core, attacking the core, using his abilities so he can get the malevolence procs on the core. That's also something that I want to bring up as well. Malevolence increases your DPS a decent amount. So if you're ever on like a camp and you're just trying to speed up a camp with your team, use your abilities and make sure to get those those auto attack procs off of Malevolence. I'm not going to say you're going to be someone who can really solo camps and you can do it in a reasonable time. But what I will say is that it's a decent way to speed up a camp that your team's already doing, uh, especially in the, the early to mid game. And so he ends up taking out the core right here. And that is why the pros play Diablo. Uh, he's a very, very powerful tank for setting up early and mid game kills. He's got one of the best pick abilities in the game and a great team fight at that. Um, he works really well with a wide variety of heroes, heroes that can follow up his CC as well as heroes that just need a little bit of peel. And surprisingly, Diablo is a great peel hero as well. He didn't really need peel against that group that he was going against, but one of the things that you can utilize on Diablo is the fact that he has two point and click stuns. So if you're ever going against a very mobile hero like a Tracer or a Genji, Diablo is actually a great pick to not only set up for kills against the enemy team, but also to peel against something like a Tracer that's trying to dive in on your back line. You can quickly push her away into a point and click flip, and she's forced to use her E or at least a couple of her dashes to get away, and she'll want to look twice before trying to engage on the back line again. Um, and that's what makes Diablo so good is not only is he picked a lot for these types of pick comps, but he's also picked a lot um, to to peel against dive comps. So he's kind of a, a hero that can be picked into a lot of different comps. And if you can learn from Lauber's style, then you'll find yourself winning a lot more than you're losing. So that is why the pros pick Diablo. He definitely has a lot of different builds you can go. So if you are going to learn from this build, you also want to learn from this play style and make sure that you know what kills you can go for. He's kind of one of those that's going to require a little, a little bit of limit testing in all three of his builds, honestly. You're going to really want to try out what you can and can't do. And in order to learn what you can't do, you kind of need to do things that you might not feel comfortable doing. 
um in w builds one of my favorite combos is just diving into their team getting a couple w's off and then popping my ult immediately and it, i can take a fight that looks awful and turn it into an amazing fight but it takes a lot of games to know when it's a good time to jump in and start doing that and same thing in this build he went for a lot of kills that i think most players wouldn't think you can get especially like that kill in mid lane um where it was just the the junk rider nazebo sitting behind both turrets and a uh and a fort and just gets jumped on and it's like those are the the fights that you have to kind of limit test to learn from but if you guys can learn from this video as well as limit test a little bit understand what you can and can't do then diablo is a great hero to move up in storm league and an amazing hero in the competitive environment thank you guys so much for watching and feel free to check out my other videos